So yeah, thanks for coming to my talk, everyone. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour of Sussex's marine conservation zones. So just a little bit about me. I work for the Trust in two different roles. I work on the Wild Coast Sussex project, which is a new lottery funded project, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the talk. And I also spend a bit of time as living seas officer. So basically anything marine conservation related. So in Sussex, we are very lucky to have some really beautiful terrestrial habitats, such as woodlands, heathlands, and chalk grasslands. And although the Sussex coastline is around 145 kilometers long, I do sometimes feel like the marine environment is kind of gets a bit forgotten or overlooked. And I think this is because it's under the waves, it's out of sight and therefore out of mind. And I think if you don't have a particular interest, it's much more difficult sometimes to learn about because it's not right there for you to see. So I hope I can show you some of that today. And although, yes, we are in the English Channel, sometimes it may look pretty grey, um, uninviting. Um, I can absolutely assure you that it's bursting full of fascinating and colourful and amazing life. So just a little bit first to show you some kind of loose comparisons between some terrestrial animals and some marine ones. Here is a kingfisher. And just to show you, this is a cuckoo wrasse. So it's a fish. And can you just, that comparison really blows my mind. It's almost like for like in color. And this fish, it really looks like something that you would find in a tropical ocean, but we find it off the coast here, pretty much all around the UK. And I just think they're very beautiful fish. And people are often surprised we find such colorful fish in our waters. Here is a very beautiful pyramidal orchid and we have something else in the sea that can rival that bright, bright color. We have strawberry anemones. Now, these are called strawberry anemones simply because of the green dots all over its body, which look a bit like strawberry pips. Um, they can get quite big and you can find them in rock pools. Now, this is one of my favorite comparisons. I'm sure there's many a slug enthusiast out there who might get a bit upset with me by saying, I think a nudibranch is a lot more exciting than a garden slug. I mean, I hope a lot of you out there as well, as Michael said, are nudibranch um, enthusiasts. So they are sea slugs. Um, this particular individual species, um, it eats um, animals that have stinging cells such as you can see just here um, is a hydroid and it will eat those stinging cells, pass it through their digestive system, which then um, will go into the tips of these things here, which are called their serrata. So then if it tries to get, if it gets um, attempted to be eaten by a predator, that predator will then get stung and will stop trying to eat it. So it's an incredible defense mechanism that this particular species have. And I just think it's absolutely spectacular looking. Sadly, as I'm sure many of, you, many of you are aware, there are a myriad of threats facing the marine environment. I'm just going to give you a very, very quick snapshot of some of them now. Um, obviously, climate change is probably the biggest threat that is facing our planet at this moment in time. Um, and it doesn't obviously exclude the marine environment, unfortunately. Um, in terms of rising sea levels, um, temperature rise, and ocean acidification as well. And then we've got the ever prevalent problem of marine plastic pollution. So this is any plastics found in the marine environment. And as I'm sure many of you can go on walks on the beach, and there is never a time when you don't find plastic on the beach. And it takes hundreds of years for it to degrade. It just breaks up into smaller, smaller pieces um, blocking the digestive tracts of animals, getting tangled in um, fishing wire. It's a big problem. And then overfishing and um, exploitation of resources as well is a, is a big problem for the marine environment. So as I said, this is just a tiny snapshot, a snapshot of the threats facing um, the marine environment. Um, so there are things that individuals can do to help. Um, such as doing beach cleans, a uh, two minute beach clean every time you go to the beach, reducing your individual carbon footprint, choosing sustainable seafood. But in terms of like larger scale initiatives, thankfully there are ways to protect the marine environment. 
And one method is by creating marine protected areas or MPAs. This is sort of an umbrella term for any sort of marine reserve. Um, so they have to be, they have to kind of tick a certain number of criteria for it to actually work. So first of all, they need to be big enough and to protect an, a big enough area. They need to be close together because many marine species are mobile. They will swim out of a protected area. So there needs to be another one close by so that it's still protected. They need to be representative. So they need to protect a wide range of species and habitats. There need to be enough of them. And the science actually says um, we should be protecting at least 30% of global oceans in order for MPAs to actually make a difference. And they need to actually be actively protected. So it's all well and good having lines on a map, but they need to, the, the rules within the areas actually need to be enforced for them to mean anything. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little video. I apologize in advance. Sometimes Zoom videos, videos on Zoom are a bit uh, broken up, but hopefully it should work. I did test it earlier. Um, just, just as a, uh, something to say, it's a, all this footage was shot in the UK. So yeah, that's a really nice video that just shows you how our oceans can really thrive when they're protected properly. So protection, protections for the marine environment are a little bit behind um, protected areas on land in the UK. Um, but following pressure from groups such as the Wildlife Trusts um, to generate um, legislation and political will, the government brought in the Marine and Coastal Access Act in 2009, and this allowed the creation of Marine Conservation Zones, or MCZs. So we did have some MPAs before this, but we didn't have many of them and they weren't representative. So this was really the first 
real drive to create a coherent network of MPAs in the UK. And they are essentially areas that protect a range of nationally important rare or threatened species and habitats with the aim to create a cohesive network of protected areas um, to help marine habitats and species to thrive and recover. So there are now um, 91 MCZs in waters around England, and there are similar schemes around Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And in Sussex, we are lucky enough to have nine of them, and they were designated in three um, different um, tranches. So the first one in 2003, we got Pagham Harbour, Kingmere, and Beachy Head West. And in 2016, we got Offshore Brighton, Offshore Overfalls and Utopia. And then just in 2019, the last three were designated. Um, we got Selsey Bill and the Hounds, Beachy Head East and Inner Bank. Yeah. So um, MCZs are designated for different features depending on the site. So management of each one is different and tailored specifically for its needs. And in terms of enforcement, um, fishing activity activity is regulated by the IFCAs, so they're the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authorities, which cover the whole coastline of the UK. And then um, the MMO, the Marine Man Management Organization, regulates activities beyond six nautical miles and issues licenses. Just a bit of dry information there that some people might want to know. Um, so yeah, here we go. Let me take you on, on my tour of Sussex MCZs. Grab your mask and snorkel. Sadly, we're not actually going underneath the waves today as much as I would really love to. Maybe even put on a dry suit because it's pretty cold up there at the moment. I think maybe around six or seven degrees, which is quite cold. Okay, so the first one I'm gonna take you to today is Kingmere. So this was designated in 2013 and it was designated for its rocky reefs. Um, and these um, rocky reefs of, and chalk habitats um, support an abundance of marine life. So many creatures, including um, Tom Blennies, which is what you can see here, and cat sharks um, make use of the shelters in the rocks as lobsters and spider crabs and many, many other creatures. So another uh, reason it was uh, protected were for the black sea bream that are found here. So. Um, Kingmere MCZ is the most important regional location for the breeding um, population of black sea bream. And um, they've got a really fascinating and complex biology. And um, they actually all first start life as um, females, and then they may change to a male when they're larger and older. So if there aren't enough males in the breeding population, then the sort of larger, more mature females will actually turn into a male so that there are enough. Um, enough of them to be able to breed. Um, and they make these really amazing nesting sites. Um, you can see this circle here. This, uh, the male makes these on the seabed and they can shift up to 70 kilograms of sand and gravel, to make these nests. Um, and then the males will actually look after the eggs um, until they hatch. So they arrive in Sussex in the spring to feed and breed and then they move further east in the summer. So that's one of the main reasons why Kingmere MCZ was protected. So I'm going to take you now to Offshore Overfalls, which was approved in 2016. So this site is a really diverse and, and species rich site. It's important for bony and cartilaginous fish like thornback rays, undulate rays and taupe, which is a kind of shark. So we've got an undulate ray here. Um, and now I'm sure many of you uh, have seen these on the beach. So these are mermaid's purses, which are actually the egg cases of sharks and skates. This is a skate egg case. They will lay them in sort of shallow protected waters. And when they hatch, the empty egg case um, will often wash up onto the beach. Now you can actually um, try to identify which species these came from by going to the Shark Trust website and any links I talk about in the talk will be, you'll find them at the end um, so you can take a look yourself. Um, but they have a really handy ID guide with like a key that will help you um, determine which species you found. 
And then you can also submit your data um, into their citizen science project, the Great Egg Case Hunt. And this will this is giving us a much better picture of what shark, ray, and skate species we've got around the UK. So it's something really great to contribute to as um, citizen science scientists. Um, so this site um, also has uh, Ross worm reefs. So these are tube building worms that sort of consolidate the sediment and allow the settlement of other species that are not found in other habitats. And this uh, then leads to a really diverse community of species. Um, we also find quite a lot of slipper limpets at this site. Now I'm sure these shells are uh, probably quite familiar to people who can access beaches at the moment. Um, you find them everywhere on Sussex beaches. It almost feels like every step you take, you're stepping on one. Um, and they're actually an invasive species from um, America that were brought over in a consignment of uh, oysters. So it's an alien species um, and it's now a serious pest of native oyster and uh, mussel beds because they outcompete them for space and food. And um, so despite them being an alien species and being a bit of a problem, they are actually quite interesting animals. Um, they breed in these stacks um, and the biggest one at the bottom will be a female. And then if she dies, then the next largest male will, bec will become a female so that they can continue to breed. And um, they just look quite strange. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we do have other alien species in Sussex. We get this uh, Japanese wireweed, which is an invasive from the Pacific. It grows very fast and blocks out the light needed for other species to grow, such as seagrass and other seaweeds. Um, and that's often the problem with invasive or alien species is that they just grow much faster than the native ones and just outcompete them for space and resources. Um, and this is a leathery sea squirt. It's also an invasive from the Pacific. It's a fouling pest on ship holes and oyster beds. Um, Apparently, they actually eat it in Korea. I and mean, that's quite a pixelated picture, apologies. But um, even so, I don't think it looks particularly appetizing. I don't think anyone will ever persuade me to try a leathery sea squirt uh, stir fry, but maybe it's nice, who knows. Um, another sea squirt we get, which is invasive, is a carpet sea squirt. And this is from Japan, the Pacific again. Um, it can get extremely large. It's very fast growing. Um, and it can survive in a really wide range of habitats. So it overtakes and again outcompetes on native species, such as shellfish and other uh, things. And they can also, it can also be a problem for boat hulls as well. So going back to um, some of our MCZs, I'm going to take you now to Celsi Bill and the Hounds, which was approved um, in the most recent tranche in 2019. So it's characterized by its unusual outcrops of limestone and clay. Um, the, the, sort of the unusual topography of the site supports high biodiversity, including a variety of algae, anemones, sponges, which you can see this is a sponge in this picture, um, and things like our native oyster. So you can often find um, seals foraging, foraging in this area. So this is a common or harbour seal. And despite its name being a common seal, they're actually nationally rare. Um, their only known rookery is in um, Chichester. So this is quite close to Chichester and you often find them foraging, hunting for food here. You can also, oh, here, sorry, here's a, one with this little head popped out. I think they're quite cute. <laughs> they're quite charismatic animals, seals. Um, so this one is a grey seal. It's the other species, we just get two in the UK, so the common slash harbour and the grey. Um, and this position it's in here, it's actually, it's called banana ring, looks like a banana. And it's thought that they do this um, while resting to keep uh, the parts of their body that are sensitive to the, to the cold out of the water, so like its tail, its flippers and its head. But it just looks quite funny, I always think, but it's always nice to see them doing this. So next we're heading to Beachy Head West, which was approved in 2019. 
And this area is characterized by highly biodiverse sandstone and chalk reefs. Um, it's got a diverse mixture of marine species, including sponges, anemones, sea squirts, and starfish. Um, so now I've got a little video for you of um, a dive, which was undertaken by a sea search diver. And I'm going to talk a little bit about sea search at the end. Um, so they were doing a survey at the time. So this was in a site of the Sex Hill Mussel Garden. In nice little snapshot there of what we can find. So I'm going to tell you a story now, something that I experienced myself in Beachy Head East. Um, so me and a group of friends went for an early morning rock pool session in a stretch of coast called Cow Gap. Um, just to caveat that this was um, last year, it was in between the, the lockdown restrictions and um, when you were allowed to meet with six people. Um, so we went for this really beautiful um, early morning rock pool session. And as we were exploring the rock pools, we found some of these, which are a, a cuttlefish eggs, also sometimes known as sea grapes because they look a bit like grapes. Um, so when we picked them up, we noticed they were sort of a little bit translucent, transparent. And you can see um, the tiny baby cuttlefish inside. So which this indicates that they could be ready to hatch. Because they were washed up, we weren't sure if they were um, still alive or not, but we thought they may have a chance of hatching. So we put them in a bucket of seawater and then we went out for a swim. Um, and during the swim, we were actually, we actually saw four gray seals, which was amazing. They just popped up, they approached us. We did not approach them, um, but they were, they didn't get too close, but they were very interested in us. They kept looking at us, popping their heads out, going back under, disappearing, swimming around, coming back up. It was really amazing. I've never swam with a seal before, so that was pretty exciting. And then when we got out and drying off, we noticed that they, cuttlefish eggs have started to hatch. So I've just got a few videos here of sort of tells the story of this. Um, here we go. So you can see a few of them here. So they're about maybe the size of like your ring finger fingernail maybe. Um, really, really small. So we kept watching them hoping to see one hatch and we did. It was absolutely amazing. So it's it's missed a little bit of the beginning but here is one that's half out of its egg um, and you can see it come out and it was absolutely amazing I've muted these videos because basically we were all just screaming at the top of our voices because we were so excited um, so it's not very nice to listen to so I've muted them 
Um, but it was just so thrilling watching this happen. And they really just look like miniature adults and they start displaying adult behaviors pretty much straight away. Some of them were releasing clouds of ink, which is a sort of defense mechanism um, for them. And some of them were putting up, they do this thing where they put two of their tentacles up um, as a show of sort of, you know, I'm big and scary, get away from me. And they were, some of them were doing that. Um, here's just another video closer up of one swimming around. It was just the most magical morning ever. And here is, here's an adult one, just to show you comparison. They really do look just like miniature adults. And it's really amazing. They, I mean, they're, they're fascinating animals. They've got this W-shaped um, pupil. They can change the color of their skin and texture of it as well in an instant. So they can like match the, their background. Um, they flash colors to communicate with other cuttlefish. Um, they're really intelligent. They're related to octopus and squid, which are also um, they're cephalopods, they're intelligent animals. And uh, they've got this skirt-like fin around their bodies that they swim with. Um, they're just amazing. And to see this happen was just like, so amazing. Um, here's just another picture of one because they're great. And then you'll be happy to know that we released them into the rock pools as the tide was coming back in. So just a little video of them swimming back into the wild. So look at them, they're really tiny. So I think about, I think it was six hatched in the end. And I think about them quite a lot. Hopefully, at least some of them are still alive. Um, Cuttlefish only live to be about live about two years. So this is quite a few months ago now. So if they're still out there, they could be quite large by now. Um, I really hope that they are. So yeah, and then oh yeah, here's one just swimming off into the rock pools on its way to freedom. It was it was amazing. So yeah, back to Beachy Head East. <laughs> so yeah, that all happened within that MCZ. It was great. Um, it was also designated um, for the short-snouted seahorse. So this is actually a priority species under the UK um, 2010 biodiversity framework, and it's protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, um, which basically means it just it's, you can't, it's illegal to disturb it. You can't move it. You're not allowed to touch them. Um, you can't take um, flash photography of them. I've sadly never seen one. It's kind of on the top of my... Sussex species bucket list, if you like. Um, they're quite hard to spot, you know, they're small, they're quite cryptic, they hide away um, in the seagrass and seaweed. Um, that said, if you do ever find one um, struggling on a beach, say maybe it's been washed in by the tide, absolutely do pick it up and try and help it. That is not illegal, that's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, they're, they're amazing creatures that are off our coast. And here's something else that you can find in Beach Heady. So this is a sea scorpion, pretty um, interesting looking fish, quite grumpy looking. It's got these spines, it looks quite threatening. Now, these are not venomous, they're not dangerous to humans. It, they're, they're a, a scorpion fish in tropical waters, which are highly venomous. And if you were to step on them, it injects venom into you and it's apparently extremely painful, but this, these ones are not venomous, but they're still pretty amazing looking. They're massive mouths, they ambush predators and kind of gobble up their prey in one go. So the last one I'm taking you to is Beachy Head West. I always get my West and East mixed up. Uh, this was um, approved in 2013. And it stretches from Brighton Marina to Beachhead Cliffs, encompassing the iconic Seven Sisters here. It has a little gap at New Haven, but it essentially stretches all that way. So a few years ago, before I was working for the Trust, um, a few of my now colleagues actually found a stalked jellyfish at the Seven Sisters rock pools. So these, despite their names, are not actually jellyfish. They're jelly-like creatures that are, they are related to jellyfish, but they aren't jellyfish as such. Um, I mean, they, are, they do share similar features, such as they have tentacles, like the jellyfish here. Um, they have a sucker at their base, which they use to attach to surfaces, such as seagrass and rocks. Um, and some species are actually capable of some movement, they cartwheel, 
um, using their sucker and their tentacles to cartwheel to maybe a place that's maybe more protected or where there's more food for it to eat. Um, and it thought that this uh, one that they found at Seven Sisters was potentially the first um, one ever recorded in Sussex, which is pretty amazing. And actually last summer at Ovingdean Rock Pools um, near Brighton, I wasn't there, I missed it. They found another one, which is also in the same MCZ. So maybe they are actually definitely here, which would be very exciting. Just a few more species we can find. That, I mean, there's extensive rock pool, stretches of rock pools in this MCZ, which are really great to explore. You can find so many different things in them. This is a top shell laying some eggs, got barnacles, a bryozoan here. We can find our friends, the nudibranch. So nudibranch um, means naked gill, because their gills are exposed. Um, that's the species gills are all around for its back. These are its, what we call it, the rhinophores, which are kind of used to sense, kind of see their environment. They sense the, the taste and smell. Um, here's another species. They're just fascinating. They come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors. Um, you can see kind of why people get a bit obsessed with them, because they are amazing. So you might one day, if you hear this story, choose to go rock pulling at night. Now, obviously, if you do, it's just be aware that it's extremely slippy and quite dangerous. Make sure you're with people, you have a light, etc. cetera. Um, but if you do choose to do so, and you can find one particular species, you can do something pretty cool. So this is just a tray of a selection of rock pool species that's been collected as the sun goes down. And you turn your lights on. So here we have a snake lox anemone. And if you were to buy a UV black light, which you can apparently find for £1.88 on eBay, you can um, shine it on the snake lox anemone and it glows in the dark. So it glows UV. Um, so this green coloration is due to a fluorescent protein in its tissue. Um, and its purpose is to protect the animal cells from harmful UV light. Um, because it lives, it lives in rock pools, in shallow water, it's exposed to sunlight quite a lot. And they can actually turn this on and off. So sometimes a snake lox anemone you find won't be this bright green color, they can look gray. And that's basically because they can turn this protein on and off. And if, it, if an anemone is in a sh uh, shadowy area, it doesn't need to have this protection. So it will turn it off and it will look gray. They're pretty amazing animals. Maybe you can try it one day. I want to. Um, so how can you get involved? As I talked about earlier, we've got a new lottery funded project for Wild Coast Sussex that I'm working on. Uh, it's a partnership project between the Sussex IFCA, the Marine Conservation Society and Sea Life Brighton, uh, led by Sussex Wildlife Trust. So our vision for Wild Coast Sussex is to inspire people about the wonderful wildlife along our coast, helping them to discover their own connection to the coast and enable them to take action to, present, to protect it. Sorry. Um, so it stretches all along the Sussex coast. We've kind of got six target areas on that map there, which encompass lots of different habitats and species and communities as well. And we're going to do this in a number of ways. So we're running um, wild beach sessions. So these are for primary school aged children um, and it's um, bringing the classroom to the beach, but in a child led risk, managed risk taking way uh, where the kids will learn about the marine environment and hopefully foster a care and sense of ownership over their local beach and coastal environment, which will then hopefully lead them to wanting to protect it. We're also running um, youth engagement sessions, working with youth groups to organize different events. Um, we are working with the Sussex IFCA and local divers to identify ghost gear in the sea. So this is lost, um, abandoned or discarded net that basically keeps indiscriminately fishing. Um, it's not only plastic pollution that breaks down into microplastic, but as I said, it's a risk of entanglement for wildlife. Um, and we then, once we found these big bits of ghost gear, we can use uh, contractors to remove it. So this net here was removed off Worthing last year as part of the project. And 
you can also volunteer for us. So this hasn't started yet because of the obvious reasons, COVID. Um, but if you keep your eyes on um, our social media channels, and I'll put the link up to um, the website as well, um, where there's a you can sign up to become on to be on our mailing list. So we're going to be looking for volunteers at kind of various different levels, ranging from like a supporter to a champion. Where we're going to recruit some junior rangers and kids, and we're going to have a wild coast council as well. So like I said, watch this space. It will be hopefully coming this year. As part of um, the Living Seas work, we um, run sea, uh, Shore Search, which is a wider wildlife trust initiative to survey the intertidal zones. So basically, it's rock pooling. Um, and the aim of the scheme is to build a baseline of data on intertidal wildlife around Sussex to help promote its conservation. So anyone can join. Um, again, the surveys have not been happening recently because of COVID, but hopefully this year they will restart. Um, I'll put a link to this again at the end, so you can uh, go on the mailing list and find out when the surveys are recommencing. Um, also, we um, are the Sussex coordinators for Sea Search. So this is a project between the Marine Conservation Society, Wildlife Trusts, and a few other bodies as well. So we get volunteer divers. So you do already have to be a qualified scuba diver. Um, and we get them to go on surveys, collecting data on habitats and species. And it's also fun and informative. It gives your dive a purpose that might not otherwise have had. Um, so yeah, that's another great way to get involved. You can also become a friend of MCZ's. Um, it's just a newsletter that you can sign up to. I think you get monthly um, uh, newsletters with information about marine conservation and MPAs. Also, last year, after months of work, an expert panel wrote a report, wrote a report for the government um, re recommending um, them to introduce highly protected marine areas to the UK. So these areas would offer the highest and strictest possible protections for the marine environment, giving nature the best chance of recovery. So by removing all um, pressures, including commercial fishing, construction, dredging, um, our shallow seas can become healthier and, and full of life once again. Um, and you can help um, to get these implemented. Um, you can write to DEFRA in support of them. Um, and they, again, the, the link will be at the end. And for anyone who's sort of interested to learn more, this is a good guidebook that I would recommend. It's sort of just a good general guide to British coastal wildlife. I've got it, it's, it's really good. Um, it's a really great place to start. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. And as always, um, we do really depend on members' support to help us deliver our work. So if you're not a member and you'd like to, then we would really, really appreciate that. Thank you very much.